feel a little in doubly intimidated, maybe almost guilty after uh, Karen's talk because uh, I was actually working for Frank Gehry for six years, <laughs> who obviously initiated maybe the the Bilbao effect, and uh, more than that, I'm French, living and working in Paris, and I believe the <laughs> Helsinki competition was uh, uh, selected, uh, was a French, half French, half Japanese uh, architect. But anyways, I I'll try to keep low profile today and, uh, <laughs> you know, stick to my talk. <laughs> anyways, so, yeah, as Laura said, I've been more specialized in, uh, yeah, anything about a uh, computer and uh, well, computers uh, are not new. We're not gonna do any rocket science today. But uh, I kind of want to talk about the interesting interaction between digital and analog. Uh, because also trying to stick to the today's uh, theme, which has been talked about interaction. So interactions, it's obviously a lot of different kind of interactions that you could have through architectural projects. And maybe I tried to gather a couple of mainly um, school projects, but also some uh, professional projects I've been working on. So it might look a little bit like a collage, but somehow uh, it also will tell, I guess, some different thematics that we approach as architects. So first I would talk about my interactions with the, in the academic world, where I've been teaching in a, a French school, the Ecole Spéciale d'Architecture, and a Swiss school in EPFL in uh, Switzerland. And somehow I tried to make these classes a little complementary, always dealing with different uh, phases of the architectural project. One more dealing with uh, the early phases on a project, more about conceptual design. And others more about the execution phases or uh, the yeah, construction and fabrication phases in Switzerland, obviously. We had better infrastructure there and more machines to actually cut some materials and build pavilions, as you guys did. So, first project, uh, which was last semester in the Paris School, we, they had this idea to build a pavilion, but with a very low budget. So, as a smart student in architecture, that group uh, tried to find I mean, an idea was to recycle material, you know, and since that was just the first class after spring break, they had this idea to use a very uh, common material you can have after a big party in a school. So that's kind of what they did uh, with uh, these uh, bottles. Obviously, you barely see it here, but there's a little bit of a curvature and calculation in terms of geometry in a way that they align properly and that the bottles, as they are not fully uh, extrusions, but the fact of piling them one after the other give this little slight angle, so you don't want to have fall them down uh, after a couple of days. Anyways, another example of interaction would be to try to see different methods, like typical joining methods that we use in carpentry or menuiserie or wood joints, or some other more complicated joints that you actually don't see with the Chinese um, games. And we had these students also working on this project of recycling who have been reusing uh, some leftovers from a wood shop from, uh, in the city. And they had this idea to build this uh, pavilion, which could be seen as a wall or a bench, reusing these pieces and making connecting joints, uh, not on the edges of the pieces, because they all have different dimensions, but actually inside it, see some uh, drills um, inside uh, kind of like the, the, the wood pieces. So a little bit of low tech and a bit of high tech uh, never, ne never hurts. This other project, these guys actually went to a bookshop who actually sold them for, I don't know, 10 euros, a thousand books. So yeah, what do you do with these books uh, to build something? So they actually produced these uh, wood joints in between 
and uh, in a way to just two shelves or also kind of like interior furniture, as you can see with the different uh, study models there. And uh, the biggest work was actually to sort of like take the measures of each book because they're all different. And then they had this Excel sheet and this script that actually accommodated the dimension of the holes in the wood joints to the actual wood uh, book dimensions. Another project talking about material interactions uh, where there's two material working differently, one in compression and the other in uh, traction. Uh, so this uh, project also um, evokes the tens tensegrity systems, which uh, have been having a lot of investigation with the com computing architecture the, the past years. And, uh, these, these students, they didn't have the whole engineering knowledge to actually do it, but they kind of like looked online, some pavilions, and then trying to pick and just mark with a, with a pen some uh, fabric to just really experiment and between having a digital model and physical models to sort of like master the technique of these uh, um, tents or vaults. So the, the great thing with this is that when once you just dismantle it, it takes very little space to transport. Another project and, uh, who is dealing with the material interactions, and it's all about using material uh, for what they're good at. And on this uh, bridge, rotating bridge or path project, you have on one side glass, which works well in compression, but it can break very easily, and then metal, who actually ensures the continuity where the glass would have break uh, in this. <laughs> All right, I do here. Anyways, so then talking about uh, materials, you always need to talk about geometry. And uh, that was this very early project from a student who somehow was fascinated by the pencil shavings which nowadays we don't see them that much in architecture schools, but back in the days, I guess there was a little more. And the interesting thing with them is their geometry because their the result of the interaction, the intersection between a hexagon extrusion and a conic uh, shape, which means that at the end, when you have a conic shape and when you unroll it, it's flat which means if you want to build something with that, you can use any flat material, flat metal sheets or anything. So she moved on on this uh, postulate and tried to find first a module and then an eventual grid in which she could uh, get the modules together to have a three-dimensional shape made of these two-dimensional paper sheets. Okay, so she went from very simple geometrical uh, vault to then on and on, uh, try to have more, uh, how, do you, how do you say, like diversity in the way she could build this, uh, this, this surface to finally arrive to what we call down there a uh, uh, workflow or a design system, which um, I guess is will be very important in my presentation that whenever we deal with com computer generating system, and not even with computer, but also when you design a project, there's always an underlying design system. Maybe before the computers, it was not as clear as it is now, because now when you just do parametrics, you actually need to do that all the time. So once she did it, we tried to just look at these um, investigations and have other students take on the project and investing more about this what we call curd folding project. So it's always about having paper cut it in different curves or different shapes and then trying to assemble it. It's kind of like origami but instead of having a straight fold you have a curved fold. So there have been then investigating with the proper material, which we would like to build a pavilion with. With paper, we have some maybe structural problems. So we used aluminum because it's very light and easy to fold. 
uh, but as any metal, you can fold it on this on, uh, only once. If, uh, if you fold it twice, then you just have two pieces in your hand. But at the same time, you still need it to have a little ridge to know exactly where to fold. So that's what they did with the laser, uh, not the laser cut, but like the water jet cutting machine, where usually just like cuts the piece, but water jet cutting machine works with the water and sand. So there's a function when you take off sand, then it doesn't go through the whole material and it just engraves the material. So these um, investigations were made just to know how much pressure and how thick the, the bit has to be to just do the proper uh, cut. Then once we understood how to assemble these objects together, we had a better idea of what kind of surface could it generate. We couldn't do a flat surface because with a flat surface, then we couldn't connect them all together. If it was too much curvature, same thing. The modules wouldn't connect. So we only had a very slight double curvature surface that we could do, so we designed this little shape look like uh, uh, building with a skylight and a door behind. So these are the first pieces and all of the corresponding unrolled uh, ones. So we always talk about computers, machines and robots, but in a day of a pavilion making thing, you cannot afford not just to get a robot, but also to program a robot to just do all these folds. So we have always to have some kind of a low-tech technique, which was hand folding uh, these pieces. So that's why we had this idea to um, rationalize the angles in a way that we have just eight types of angles. So we have the jig to enable to know exactly on which angle you are uh, folding. So that's the finished pavilion in the Rolex center from uh, EPFL. <laughs> <laughs> the skylight and the window in front of it. And then you see also, I haven't said, but it's a pavilion done with homogeneous joints, which means it's just only with the material itself that we connect the pieces. There's no addition of, of any other uh, elements you can see there. So there's one ridge which is folded and the other is just like the assembly. So after we decided to take advantage of the work of one of the many laboratories there is on EPFL campus, who, is, who has been investigating for 15 years the use of structural glass in architecture. And um, so we just, yeah, try to just understand what, um, how could we use that in the building of a student pavilion. So the idea was to understand how, um, yeah, glass works structurally and to kind of pile up glass as you would do a um, house of card, okay? Um, so this collaboration was done with this uh, laboratory ICOM and uh, they first thing that they told us, if you want to work with structural glass, don't make any holes in the glass because it will uh, make it way less uh, s strong, obviously. And if you do, uh, second of all, you have to do have very simple geometry, a rectangle or a square will be always stiffer than any other crazy geometry. And then always polish the edges because if you don't do that, that's what you can see here. These are weakening a lot, the glass. Any little crack on an edge, then is the start of a hole, uh, like a big hole or a break. Then once we knew this, how the material works, then we can start interact with the geometry and the system that we are gonna build on. So we just started with the simplest thing, postulate that every single glass panel will be held by two other glass panels below. The problem is with this is that uh, it can collapse in a direction or in the other. That's why, as you always do in architecture, you add a third one, okay? So it stays, but not as it is now, but then adding a plan that uh, makes 
the horizontal uh, moves uh, an existing, then you finally have a system that works. Once we have this, we, um, we have been populating the system horizontally and vertically, saying that another rule that if you have three pieces, they should never meet in one point in space, because if you have a, for a rotating force with the axis on this point, then obviously they will also have a good tendency to collapse, okay? Then we started obviously on, after the first um, investigations of, of, of pining, obviously the first mock-ups. So it, we worked with um, glass obviously, but also wood, because we have a CNC milling machine and wood is very easy to cut. Actually, it's the most ductile material after butter, of course. So the, the thing was to really have this thickness of this uh, glass uh, exactly as the glass was. So also inside the wood, the glass wouldn't uh, switch too much. So once we did that, we then we needed to understand how kind of we could assemble all these pieces together. So we looked to a truly um, typology that you can find in the vernacular architecture from northern Italy and try to see how they assembled the stones to make these very nice vaults. So we saw that our system was quite accommodating in terms of surfaces. We could have um, uh, dome surfaces, but also more like flat surfaces with double curvature like there. The only thing was not to have too much of a big change from one floor to another in order to have always overlapping metal uh, glass pieces. So finally we found ourselves quite free in terms of shape generation and we decided to have this urban furniture project which in not just being double shape or organic uh, we wanted to have uh, to have the possibility for the people to have a lot of interaction with the project. So then we did some calculations. Always try to be sure before building something that it's not going to fall down. And then that was the final project. So as you see. There's not the regular details of a building. So there's no um, frames around the windows. So many people, when they see this picture, they cannot tell the scale of the projects. And some people at school, they were thinking that was also like a prototype for a big tower. Because in architecture, when you see an image, it's with the frames or the handrails and all these like objects that you always have the habits to see that gives you the scale of the project. Well, here, obviously, there's none of it. Some more details. So we added these rebars, these um, metal bars, to compress everything because of wind uh, problems, security. Okay, so I have then an animation here saying, okay, what would it be if we would like to scale it up? So this is the experiment of uh, this laboratory, uh, ICOM from Lausanne, who's been working all these years on, um, on structural glass and this is the example of the test of a beam under a lot of pressure and these are three layers of glass with one rebar on the bottom that gives the whole strength to it and actually this test showed that there's the curve, the resistance curve of the, of, the, of the beam showed that there's even more resistance once the beam is getting crushed than before. So that's a way to say that it's quite safe. So that was kind of like the, the need we had to say how do you expand the system and how can you actually just not do pavilions but like make proper buildings uh, with structural glass. And then that's kind of going towards the question of saying, okay, uh, how does it change life for us as designers? How does it change the spaces we're designing? How does it change the functions and so on? Today, no time for that talk, sorry. Anyways, I've been showing so far projects that are showing this kind of interaction, mostly about 
we always start with the material, okay? What material do you start with? Then this material, is it flat? What kind of geometry does it have? If you work with it, but then if you want to handle it or assemble it, and then the fabrication method. So these are the three main axes that we've been working on. But as architects, obviously, you always want to ask, well, how does it produce on space or on functions? So I can show you some other projects that we kind of like took on the, the glass um, experimentation where we needed to, all these models that you saw after one summer, we all came back and all the models were crushed somehow. We don't know how, so we say, okay, we need a warehouse. So we started to have the students work on a warehouse project where you all obviously need some um, uh, space where you put the models in and some space where you can actually see them. So this project was more about having, um, you know, at the same time a corridor, but at the same time a little bit of a billboard of what would be done in the, in, in the class. And they finally had, instead of doing this mass project or this uh, rib-like project, they tried to find like a halfway work between uh, both proposals. And then this other project, which was uh, trying to deal with the same issue of, of having this little museum for the class models, who instead of having a unidirectional path through it, they did a three-dimensional little labyrinth uh, space, which has been inspired by them by this movie Superman, where, I don't know if you know the scene where you, you, you see him in this room in this ice room where there's a lot of different floors and there's like a lot of like ice falling from everywhere and especially ice is very uh, reflecting or refracting so there's a very interesting perception of space that you have once you're there so that's kind of what they try to do through this uh, vertical glass and platform labyrinth and finally the first visitor and then talking about again about space and space use we had this semester this other semester where we had the students work that was just after the london olympics 2012 where we always had this question well we always build in the cities these huge infrastructures that once in their lifetime are used for their full potential so we try to have the students to think of how can you reuse them so this is not this London 2012 um, uh, stadium. This is a soccer stadium from Qatar for 2020, the Al Qar uh, Stadium, which obviously is huge. And the students had the idea of saying, okay, instead of having all these, um, um, these seats that obviously only during the World Cup, you have all that many people. Then let's just convert all the surrounding ones in a big space for, like, let's just bring the city in the stadium. I don't know if you're, you, if you're familiar with the Medina typology in uh, all uh, Maghrebin uh, countries. So we just told them, just design and build a Medina there. So that's kind of what they did. They tried to analyze the Medinas that you can see here in uh, Marrakesh find some house typology and more uh, some uh, paths, usual paths that you could see there. Another one here from Esaouira. And there's a lot of them which are like just traversing houses. It's not only corridors where you have like the public and the private space like very separate, but here you actually have, the, the, you're allowed to get in a private space to go from one space to another. So they kept on going in this analysis and try to sort of like resample uh, the uh, Medina and kind of pasted it in the stadium. And this is the kind of geometry you would uh, see. So in a way that's very convenient because in the meantime, between one quarter and the second quarter, you can always go and do some hardcore shopping on the back background. Last project for this first part is also this work on the reuse of big infrastructure. 
so this is the London Olympic Stadium. And this student, first of all, in the analysis part we had from the semester, he has been taking all of the single uh, type sports stadium typologies and just studying the steps and how, what is the angle you have to better see tennis, what is the layout you have to see better volleyball, and so on. So he was, uh, I guess, an expert in all these different kind of shapes of stadiums. So then he had the same idea, but instead of trying to reuse the outside of the stadium, he said, okay, I'm just gonna reuse the inside, because actually, if you lay down the, the London Stadium, Olympic Stadium, this is what you can put. Like you can put, I don't know, here like 15 tennis courts or six tennis courts and five volleyball. So he saw there's a lot of room for investigation there. So what he actually did, he said, okay, let's just bring them all in, okay? And if you're, uh, I don't know, a little bored with the tennis, you can always just go like a, a soccer match or a basketball one. So that's kind of how we, he found his name, the Stadium Pangea, which you probably know the Pangea was the state where way before the continents were all together before spreading out in the, in the, in the earth that we see now. So he also did a very funny video to explain his project. Oops. So then the second part will be more dedicated to what I did in the, the industry, let's say, working for Gary Technologies as a consultant. So just a little word about this. I was not Gary, working for Gary Partners, who is the design firm who are actually designing the buildings. But Gary Technologies is a consultant-based company that facilitates building construction through use of uh, yeah, digital tools, uh, platforms, we're actually doing a software, and we just go on site and help the architects or the constructors or the engineers to just, yeah, understand the project geometries or also to just have a better understanding of manu manufacturing processes. So, first project I wanted to talk about always under the realm of interaction is this Abu Dhabi uh, Louvre, uh, which again is, is a perfect example of, uh, you know, some iconic <laughs> uh, buildings that a lot of cities wanna have flourish everywhere to bring the people. I'm not specifically a fan of, yeah, uh, that many flowers on, flowers on the same spot, but anyways, it's not part of my talk. Um, so, mm. so yeah, Jean Nouvel had this idea from a long time to build a project under a big umbrella 
or like a big pergola. And he finally found the right client to actually do it. And uh, so, yeah, he, he had the idea to do this. Uh, I mean, obviously, it's quite, uh, quite warm down there. So, perfect example. Uh, they wanted to have the Louvre museums as buildings, but like have this huge uh, cover on top of it to make easier to go from one building to another and to have a real, I guess, urban uh, interaction also in the, in, inside the Louvre. So a lot of, obviously a lot of people worked on it. Uh, Atelier Jean Nouvel, but also Bureau Happold uh, for the structural design development, Gary Technologies to do the whole synthesis of all these um, informations. Transolar in charge of having the understanding of the proper light going through this, and Serma doing the full scale mock ups and analysis. So, this is the kind of workflow that you have when you work on these projects and uh, when you have all these people interacting and each people has his own specialty and it's kind of what we were branding for at Gary Technologies to just not have just sheets and calculations exchanged by emails but have a real web-based platform which you know we try to facilitate for the exchange and this iteration to be as fast and as smooth as possible okay so you go from a quantitative map from the architect who say, okay, this is where I put my building and this is where it's going to be outside corridors. So where there's these outside corridors, that's where I want to have more shadow so that people can actually walk without being sunburned. And uh, then there's the reverse modeling by Bureau Apple, which is in a way projecting these maps on the sphere to have this understanding on the sphere elements. Where do you want to have more light and where do you want to have less light coming through? And okay, then you have AJN who wants to have a control on the design and the actual look of the object. And then this testing in reduced scales to ensure that what you actually design is actually what you're gonna get. So iterations, numbers, 3D models, CAD drawings. So there's 11 layers and each of them had their own map. So I don't remember all the name of all the cells, but they all needed to be um, uh, uniquely um, numbered so you don't lose track of what you're actually designing or building. So obviously you don't do this by hand, but you try to find a very um, clean way and then a very ri rigorous way of, of, uh, of uh, nomination of each member. So once we did all this, we gave them a 3D model. Okay, now it's ready to build. But they were like, well, what do we do with a 3D model? We still need the paper prints. So obviously, we, we like the idea of having a paperless delivery project, not just to save all the trees that are being cut to produce the paper, but also, yeah, all the information is there. But still, they wanted to have prints. So we needed to just go from this 3D model fully, um, fully documented to actually enroll or find a way to just yeah, print it on paper. So we do, did these huge printouts and we, in a way, automatically generated in 10 days, uh, yeah, I don't know, all these 200A0 annotated CAD drawings, all these angles and all these measures. So obviously, you don't want to do this by hand because even if you're fast enough, you're always going to do one mistake. So that was one project. The second project is <laughs> maybe even more uh, uh, showing some very interesting uh, management of public and private funds. But again, I'm not gonna, get, it's not my field. <laughs> I will just again talk about the, the, the workflow that we use to actually make it happen. So obviously very complex shapes with a lot of different parts in the building. There's these, on top of it, these glass uh, sails that are double curved. And uh, yeah, I mean, a lot of complexity. So anyways, in a way to ensure that you can deliver this kind of complexity, you have to have some kind of a tree structure that you can see on the left of the screen. 
which is in a way classifying your model. It's not only layers as you see on your usual software, but it's just a way to recombine the model in different ways. And each of us in the team, people from GT, were taking charge of one of the models. The architecture on top, the structure here, the, um, the pipings, and the envelope. Always oh, down there. And then cutting it in major locations, east, west, center, basement, and minor locations. And it's all about being a framework to be able to read the project in uh, different um, because you cannot open the whole model, it's too big, so you want to be able to just go through the model and pick up the information that you actually want, and whenever there's a problem, there's a clash, you want to ensure that you can kind of see where it is. So we went through these, what we call these box sections, or more these accident, accidental um, parts, and used them during the whole construction site, to just locate where there are clashes and just try to just every day solve the problem. Of course on the computer, but also throughout meetings. So these are the metrics of interaction of all the different disciplines that we had, which automatically generated them. A way to really very quickly s summarize how we, how the whole teams have been trying to solve all the, all the problems which we always talk about synchron collaboration, when you try to just at the same time work on the same model, or asynchron collaboration, where somebody changes something one day and then you, the day after, the guy from LA work during the night, so you just wake up when he actually goes to bed, and then you just pick up the project and try to solve another problem. So all of this went pretty well, and people, construction companies, at the first time, they were very reluctant to use 3D. They always wanted to just make plans and sections because that's how the business works. But at the end, they got so excited about it that they modeled all every single nuts and bolts, which made the model pretty hard to handle, but still, in a way, quite unique. Uh, so at the end, there was a lot of people using it, almost 300 simultaneous users a lot of different versions because that was web-based and the web-based kind of like saying every single version of the project so you can always return to how was my project two days before and uh, different accesses if you're a project manager or if you're a designer or etc cetera, etc cetera. so trying to just go back to i don't know interactions of construction industry how it was a little before when there was mainly the master builder and or the architect who was kind of in charge of everything and following the whole construction process from the early design to every single stone cutter on site. And now obviously we have all these guys trying to just understand what to do. And we praise obviously for, instead of trying to look at the same plan and find the same version of what am I looking at, have some kind of a system that enables um, kind of like um, ensure that we all look at the same project when you talk about it as we're doing it and maybe I don't know uh, it's not for today but maybe later we will interact way more uh, virtually also by uh, designing our projects so I think that's it thank you